Welcome everyone. This is Pastor Manny Gonzalez of Gold, um, Gold River Calvary Chapel. Thank you for joining me for this midweek study. Um, let's go ahead and begin with prayer and then we'll jump right into our teaching this uh, evening. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we're able to meet together, though virtually. And Lord, we ask that your spirit will just teach us and show us what it is that you would want us to know, Lord. Help us, Lord, in our growth and our spiritual walk, Lord, and Lord, that we make um, have a growing relationship with you, Lord, and that you would um, bless our evening and our time. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our last uh, study, we left off with a group of people who wanted to make Jesus their king because they saw that he fulfilled this coming uh, prophet that Moses spoke of back in, in the Old Testament after they, saw, they witnessed Jesus feeding thousands of people. But Jesus would not allow himself to be manipulated, coerced, or forced to do man's will. And so he went away from the multitude deeper into the hillside by himself to be, get away from the crowd. When evening came, Jesus walked on water where he met up with his surprised disciples and they all immediately crossed over to the Sea of Gal on the Sea of Galilee to the town of Capernaum. Our teaching picks up where the crowd of people who saw Jesus perform the miracle of feeding thousands of people in Capernaum where they find Jesus there. The portion of scripture we will delve into revealed that Jesus is the source of eternal life that is from heaven. Jesus will show them that he is the bread from heaven that they should be pursuing and not be so consumed with that which is, that will perish this side of heaven. The title of this study is Jesus, the source of eternal life. So with that, let's go to John chapter six, if you're not there already, John chapter six, verse 22 through 25, <clears throat> where we read, on the following day when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So it's the day after. And the people who had witnessed and experienced Jesus' gracious and miraculous feeding of thousands were now looking for him. They knew that the disciples got on their boats and left without Jesus. And yet Jesus could not be uh, found among where they were at. So seeing that both Jesus and his disciples were not there, many got on their boats and crossed over on the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum to look for Jesus. But once they found Jesus, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? See, they had no clue how Jesus got over to the other side. And this bit of, this bit of information of Jesus walking on water evidently was strictly for his disciples to witness and experience at that time. And have you noticed the, that sometimes the Christian life can be that way where we can get to experience something special for that moment with God that is just only for you, that is for me? Have you experienced that? Now, where exactly in Capernaum did they find Jesus? Well, if we were to go ahead to verse 59, it seems like Jesus was busy teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So the beginning of this narrative may have taken place at the synagogue. And if so, Jesus gave one sermon all the way through at least verse 59, though this chapter goes through um, verse 71. The people he appeared to be speaking to were the local Galileans, those who had traveled far, to, um, from the day before, uh, um, witnessing the, the feeding of the thousands, and, all, and as well as the Jews. The religious authorities are there as well, as we shall see, and they will engage with him later on <clears throat> in this chapter. Verse 26 and 27, Jesus answered them 
and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because the God, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Just as Jesus had forego with the platitudes or the flattery from Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, here Jesus jumps right in again and began to share some hard truths um, that was in their hearts. And he began using that uh, a phrase to give importance about what he's about to say. Most assuredly, I say to you. And if you recall from a couple of weeks ago, the words most assuredly are the familiar words, amen, amen. That's what he's saying. Be Jesus beginning to say amen, 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 I say to you. Truthfully, truthfully, I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you, what Jesus started to say was that their interest in him was pretty shallow. They were all thinking about this from their stomach. You would think that they would at least ponder who Jesus truly was after doing the miraculous of feeding 10,000 people from just lo five loaves of bread and two fish. But they did not respond the way the disciples did, who when they saw Jesus enter their boat, at least they thought, who is this man who walks on water and also has control and authority over the storm? See, what the crowd saw in Jesus was, for them, he was their personal bread factory. They had as much as they wanted, and they were satisfied of the physical food that he provided for free. But they failed to see the spiritual implication for they wanted to make him king for their own purposes. And like, again, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, Jesus used something familiar to make a spiritual point. In this case is food, more specifically bread. Jesus's point was that the food they sought is a representation of the temporal material things of this world. God is not against us in us acquiring or possessing material things this side of heaven, but those things do not have eternal value. That, that is not our ultimate pursuit in life. Just like Jesus was offering living water to the Samaritan woman, Jesus offered the people this living food that was eternal. And like living water, this spiritual food will only come through Jesus Christ. True living is not through amassing things that easily perishes here on earth. True living is found in the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus, who is the source of life, eternal life. And the truth of his statement was authenticated by the seal God the Father had set on him. And that Greek word for sealed, phragizo, as one Bible commentator, commentator shared, means God has placed his seal of approval on him that Jesus can provide the food that endures to eternal life. In other words, God authenticated that the enduring provision for eternal life was through Jesus Christ. I'm inclined to believe that when Jesus was being baptized, God gave his authentication, his approval, his seal of his son audibly stating that he was well pleased in his son. And then there's the Holy Spirit that gave his authentication, his approval, his seal as, as a dove when he descended as a dove upon Jesus, who testified that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And that was on John chapter 1, verse 32 through 34. So far, now in these first um, six chapters of John, of the Gospel of John, the writer John have been giving proofs of who Jesus truly is and why we are to believe in him. The more you study and understand the scripture, the more you see that God really wants us to know who Jesus is, the love 
of the Father for humanity, the mission of sending His Son, Jesus, down from His heavenly throne to dwell among us. And when you are open to the truth of God's Word, plus to be taught by the Holy Spirit, you really begin to see more of God's plan, the unfolding of God's story of redemption, and the willingness of Jesus doing the will of the Father to point to the point of dying on the cross for our sins, to the point of shedding His blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and for giving us eternal life on the cross in place of sin. See, the Bible becomes then alive. It becomes very plain that God really desires to save us sinners. But it will only come by way through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? So continuing on in verse 28 through 29. Then he said to him, they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. They asked Jesus, What can we do to perform the works of God? In other words, what work of God is required of them? And Jesus answered the question, asked, saying, You want to know what is that work of God that he wants you to work on? You want to know what God requires of you? That you believe in him who he sent. Jesus was speaking of himself. He's saying, believe in me. That's what he's saying. Put your faith in the one that the Father has sent to you. And what does the, uh, and, and, and it says, and what does faith require, right? It requires belief, or more accurately, to believe, to believe in Jesus. That is what's required from us. Now, the words, the work of God speaks of what requires from us. However, we all know, though, that we do not work for our salvation. We don't. But for anyone to obtain salvation from God, as stated here, one must believe in Jesus for salvation, to receive eternal life. And what's required is pretty straightforward. He said that you believe in the one he has sent. That's it. Believe in Jesus. But then look what they asked of, of him. It's, it's really, really kind of unbelievable what they do here. Look at verse 30 through 33. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So it's like, really? You want another sign? I mean, it's interesting that they would ask for more signs because if you go back to, just go up to uh, verse 2. It says, then a great multitude followed him because they what? They saw him, what? They saw his signs, which he performed on those who were, who were deceased. So many were firsthand eyewitnesses of Jesus healing the sick. And on top of that, they just witnessed the day before how Jesus performed an incredible miracle of feeding over 10,000 people, if we're including men, women, and children, from just five loaves of bread and 10 fish. I mean, the nerve of them. They wanted to see more signs and they will believe in you, Jesus. They had as much as they wanted and they had their fill. And who's to say that many, oh, you know, they were affected by Jesus' healing of people they may have known. And maybe they were healed themselves. And now they're asking Jesus to perform another sign, just one more sign, as if he was some kind of sideshow, so that they may see it and believe him? Really? Now, unless I'm reading too much into this, their interaction is really kind of strange here because <clears throat> reading from the Christian Standard Bible, this said in verse 30 and 31, what are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. I'm, I'm trying to figure out 
maybe just speculation on my part as far as what is the tone here, but it's just strange to me. What work or what are you going to do this time, Jesus? Because you feeding us with bread, that's really nothing new. Because you know, Jesus, Moses did that one before you arrived. I mean, that almost sounds like that's what it's saying. Moses was the one that fed our ancestors manna, this bread, while in the desert. So this is nothing new. We've seen this before. And then without miss, missing a beat, Jesus said, you really think that Moses was the one who fed you bread of all places that came from heaven during the wilderness years? Moses? Really? Is that what you think? Well, maybe he didn't have that kind of tone, but you get what I'm saying here. I mean, look at verse 32. Jesus said, truly, truly, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. And here, the, notice the two truths in one sentence here. And, and listen to this. Firstly, what Jesus does here is that Moses did not feed them this miracle physical bread that came from heaven. All right. So if they're sitting there saying that this was all Moses, no, um, Jesus dispensed with that idea. But then secondly, the father is now offering a different bread. He's offering them the true spiritual bread that is from heaven. The word true as used here does not mean earthly acceptability, but it is in relation to God's holy and righteous character that is eternal, divinely sincere, and correct. And, th and what is that divine truth Jesus shared that is from the Father? And here is now we, we're starting to see Jesus is starting to describe himself as this bread that is directly from heaven, this manna, the true manna from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus told them that basically... You know, when we think of um, bread and stuff, we think of food and we think of, you know, as a source of life. Well, Jesus is saying to them that he was the source of eternal life, that the source of even spiritual life, which he offers to the whole world. He is that source. He is this bread. But like Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, they miss the initial meaning of what Jesus is conveying to them. In fact, look at verse 34 through 40. <clears throat> then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Now, does that sound familiar? Jesus offered the Samaritan woman living water. She said, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. Remember that? I won't get thirsty again. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will. So he's already describing where he's, truly, his, uh, where he's truly from. He's from heaven. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day as i said before the samaritan woman man wanted this living water from jesus that he was offering where she doesn't have to worry about being thirsty ever again where she doesn't have to worry about leaving from her home um traveling up to the well with her bucket or buckets drawing water out and dealing with the weight of the water and then traveling back I mean, who, who wants this? Who, who, who would not want this kind of uh, living water when you don't have to worry about all that kind of stuff, right? Oh, how life would be easy if that kind of water were, I don't have to thirst again. Oh, life would be so easy 
Jesus, if you would just give us this bread that we would never hunger again. A never ending supply of living water and not to thirst again. A never ending of bread and not to hunger again. I mean, who would want that? But see, they were thinking with their stomach and they were misunderstanding Jesus. He spoke here now the first of his seven I am's. This is the first one. I am the bread of life. And notice first that Jesus pointed to everyone listening to him of his true divine identity. I am. He begins his sentence saying, I am. And no one uses those words unless you're looking to be stoned to death because that's blasphemous. No person can say I am except the Lord. So what do we have here? But by addressing himself, I am, with the name he used with Moses, he is identifying to them that he is Lord. And if he is Lord, then he is telling the crowd in the synagogue that I am the Lord who is the source of your spiritual life. I am the Lord who provides all your spiritual sustenance that you would ever need and want. In a way, the writer here, John, is still using the, the typology um, thing between um, Moses and Jesus here, which we covered a couple of weeks ago in John chapter 5, verse 16 through 47. But however, Moses can never and would have never addressed himself as the I am, for that would be blasphemy. But Jesus can call himself or address himself or use the words I am, for he is God. He was always God and became God in the flesh. And in him is the source of spiritual life. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4 and 14 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The bread of life is God in the flesh, and that person is Jesus. That's what he's telling them. Jesus then said, He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And this is a really fascinating statement that Jesus says here, because Jesus was equating coming to him, he who comes to me, with believing in him. He who believes in me. Jesus as the source of eternal life can only be obtained by coming to him, which requires believing in him. In a nutshell, they were seeking a physical need that was temporary. What they wanted was only as good as the next meal, the next meal, and the next meal. But Jesus wanted them to focus on him for their deeper spiritual needs, which is eternal. And the word never, never hunger, never thirst, it implies satisfaction, meaning that Jesus was satisfied <clears throat> their every spiritual needs forever and never be without. That's what Jesus is saying. The fullness of life is found in Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus, the fullness of life is found in Jesus? Because that's what he's saying here. He is our bread of life. In verse 36, seeing Jesus and believing Jesus are two different things. Seeing him and believing him. According to verse 36, you can see Jesus and not believe. These people saw Jesus along with all his miracles. The healing of the sick. And then there was the what? Um, the feeding of the 10,000. What if those that met Jesus before, back the year before, at the Passover when he cleansed the table, uh, when he cleansed the, the tabernacle, I meant the, excuse me, the temple, 
Maybe some of them weren't there. And it says that after he cleansed the temple, that he did signs there as well. And here, these people saw Jesus all this time doing all these miracles and signs, and yet they show no belief or that saving faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't believe in him. In verse 37 through 40, we see this mysterious yet amazing tension between God's sovereignty and humanity's will or humanity's free will when it comes to salvation. In verse 37 through 39, we see that the active role of God the Father is to bring people to His Son, Jesus. That is why God the Father sent His own Son, Jesus, to come down to earth, to humanity. It's about salvation. This was the will of the Father. And those that the Father gives to His Son, Jesus, Jesus' purpose is not to reject them, but to receive them because it is the plan of the Father. Some would say that this speaks of the assurance of, of our salvation or eternal security. But notice the flow of what Jesus was saying. Our eternal security is predicated upon Jesus obeying the will of the Father, which is to those the Father gives to Jesus, who he will not lose, but will raise them up to life on the last day. Last days in reference to, as the late Bible teacher Warren Wiersbe uh, shared, his return and the final events that climax God's program for mankind. All right? Because once he returns, then that's it, right? So Jesus' obedience to the Father secures our salvation and there's uh, our resurrection. However, another part of the Father's will in sending His Son Jesus is so that each individual who encounters Him and believes in Him may have everlasting life. This is speaking of human responsibility. This is speaking of human free will that God had gifted humanity since the, um, the, uh, the time of creation in the Garden of Eden. We are responsible for believing in Jesus Christ. God will never coerce or force anyone to believe in His Son, Jesus. That is the choice that we must exercise. But if we don't, we stand condemned for rejecting Jesus and be condemned forever. And Jesus spoke about that in, in um the latter part of John chapter 3, verse, what is that, 16 through 20, 21? In the end, the Father has willed that our source of eternal life comes through and only through Jesus Christ, who is our spiritual um, life. He is our life. He is the bread of life, the source of our life, the source of eternal life. So in closing, there is a well-known saying, there's variations of it you know, out there, but there's this one saying that goes something like this. Before we enter in through heaven's door, we see a sign on the outside that say, whosoever will may come. And as we go inside and turn back and look over the door, another sign says, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I, I love that. <laughs> Whosoever will, chosen in Christ, co coexisting together. Some people may have a problem with that. Some people may have a hard time reconciling the sovereignty of God with humanity's free will. The truth is, it's that there is nothing to reconcile when both truths are found in God's word. To reconcile means to, re to reunite as if they were separated to begin with. But both truths are bound together in Scripture. They have never been separated to begin with. There's absolutely nothing to reconcile here. In fact, Warren Wiersbe quoted this about, uh, quoted this about Spurgeon, and I love Spurgeon's answer to this. When it comes to God's sovereignty and uh, humanity's free will, <clears throat> he said, quote, When a church member asked Charles Spurgeon how he reconciled these two, he replied, 
I never try to reconcile friends. I love that. I think that's just really awesome. But I also agree with Warren Wiersbe says, because he goes into more depth, and I like what he says here, and I wholeheartedly agree with him and this perspective. And I think it's a perspective that we need to adopt here. Quote, from our human and limited perspective, we cannot see how divine sovereignty and human responsibility can work together. But from God's perspective, there is no conflict. It is the Father's will, will that sinners be saved and that those who trust Christ be secure in their salvation. Believers receive eternal life and Jesus can never lose them. Amen? We need to trust the truth of God's word. Our finite mind cannot, can only grasp how this all works. Remember the operative word, finite mind. What the Bible clearly teaches is that God chose us, and yet we are called to believe in the Son, the Father, sent to us for our salvation. We need to humbly embrace that God did chose us before the foundation of the world. Just the thought of Him choosing us should humble us. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved but on the flip side of that the father also desires that people not perish that people believe in the son of, of God Jesus for their salvation John chapter 3 verse 16 through 18 says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but should have uh, everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Do you notice that? There's a choice there. Let me read that again. But, all right, there's the word but, he who does not believe See, there's the human responsibility there. The, either you're going to believe, that's human responsibility, or you're not going to believe, that's still a human responsibility, right? But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So clearly there is the choice of, or the, or the free will of men and women to accept Jesus or to reject him. And as I said before, to reject Jesus is to stand condemned. And you will face Jesus, not as your Savior, but as a holy and righteous judge. And condemn you forever based on you or based on your choice of rejecting Him for salvation. So if ever you are trying to wrap around your heart and mind about the sovereignty of God... And the, and, the, and the free will of man. Look to verse 37 again. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. This is God's love and grace at work, that the Father chose those for His Son, and the Son received those who believes in Him, both in tandem with one another. So in the end, it doesn't change the fact, though, that Jesus is the source of eternal life because Jesus is still the answer to that to all this Jesus he is the I am and he is the bread of life I am the bread of life amen father we thank you lord for the the, the powerful um, message that you have um, shared with us through your word lord that you are the source of our life that you are everything that humanity is looking for that and that is 
looking for their fulfillment, Lord, just as the multitudes, Lord, they fed upon the miraculous food that you've given and they were satisfied, Lord. Lord, may you open the eyes of the lost in this world and see you as this bread of life, Lord, and that they may find their fill, that they may find their satisfaction solely on you. So, Lord, we just continue to pray, Lord, for this world. We pray for our society, Lord, our community, Lord, that um, the truth of who you are will be received, Lord, and that people are coming and being added into your kingdom. So this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining me uh, next week. Um, we'll continue on with chapter six. I'm breaking it up because that's a long chapter. <laughs> chapter six is a long chapter. But uh, I just pray that next week you'll be able to join me and continue with this uh, great chapter. So until then, uh, blessings to y'all. Bye.